morning to those of you who are in North America um, and uh, welcome uh, to the panel of our Commons uh, annual conference for BAH 11 uh, that is dedicated to uh, the question of uh, refugees and the international asylum system and what to do about it, how can we reform it uh, for the better and uh, uh, it uh, this uh, uh, session uh, is part uh, of uh, our uh, conference that is dedicated to the question of uh, the dialogue of the peripheries. So we are trying to, um, while focusing, of course, on uh, the, the issues that are pertinent to the Ukrainian um, speakers and the Ukrainian um, listeners, those who are uh, here, we're trying to also have a dialogue um, with other parts of the world uh, and the questions that um, have a significance not uh, not only for Ukraine but uh, for other countries uh, and uh, in particular for countries um, of the uh, global peripheries. Uh, and my name is Anastasia Yavchuk. Uh, I am a associate professor in sociology at Kiev Mohila Academy and currently also British Academy Fellow um, at the School of Anthropology at the University of Oxford. Uh, and I will be moderating uh, today's uh, panel. Uh, it will uh, last uh, about uh, 90 minutes. Uh, the panel is uh, in uh, uh, English, uh, so all the speakers will speak in English, but there is simultaneous uh, translation into Ukrainian available uh, to those of you who registered and who are connected now via Zoom. Uh, I know some of you are also um, watching uh, online um, on YouTube via our Facebook page. So welcome to those participants whom we do not see here in Zoom, but who are nonetheless following us. Uh, and uh, because of this translation, uh, there is a request to all the speakers to try to speak uh, slowly make some gaps um, after like after each kind of significant uh, statement uh, so that our uh, translators uh, have enough time to, to translate this into Ukrainian. Uh, so this is the uh, the request from from them. Uh, and uh, as I said, the panel today will last uh, 90 minutes and uh, we um, it will not be a very you know, formal structured um, presentations, although I know that uh, Ruslana, Volha and Aisha did prepare a PowerPoint uh, to share um, their research uh, with us. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we hope that uh, after some introductory comments from all of you, we will open the floor uh, to discussion, to hear feedback uh, from uh, the audience and questions from the audience uh, and engage also in dialogue uh, among ourselves. Uh, and uh, for this, uh, those of you who have some questions or comments, you're welcome to write them down in the chat window uh, in Zoom at any time uh, during the presentations. So you don't need to wait for the presentations to, to be over. You can uh, drop a line uh, right away. I will see uh, these questions and comments, and uh, I will then uh, be reading them out uh, when we reach the Q and A uh, part of our uh, of our discussion today. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, uh, there is no possibility for kind of live uh, discussion with uh, people just connecting and and jumping in with comments. So, this is the format that we will have uh, the Q and A uh, window uh, in uh, in chat uh, in Zoom. Uh, so I hope uh, these uh, kind of more formal uh, bits uh, of, uh, of today's presentation uh, are clear. Uh, I will now uh, introduce uh, the speakers. And uh, right away, I would like to say that one of our speakers, uh, Ayman Seifeldin uh, from Sudan, uh, whom we're really counting uh, on to share the experiences from the African context, unfortunately cannot make it. She just sent an apology um, this morning uh, saying that she's not feeling, uh, feeling very well. Uh, so we wish her uh, uh, recovery and unfortunately she will not be here. And also uh, know that Volha is uh, Volha Bizikova, one of the uh, presenters in, in the first uh, group, uh, uh, along with Ruslana and Aisha. Uh, she also has COVID. She is present today. Uh, so we are grateful to you, Volha, for still making it. 
uh, but yeah, with her camera off and uh, uh, she will not be contributing. Maybe uh, at some point she will write a few words or um, uh, make a, a short comment. But uh, yeah, unfortunately we are in the season of uh, flu, COVID, all the viruses now. So um, these are the, the some of the um, unfortunate uh, changes to um, our program today. Uh, but apart from that, we are happy to welcome uh, Ruslana Kuzienko, uh, who is a social anthropologist uh, from Central European University in Vienna. And then Aisha Chalar, uh, who is also a social and cultural anthropologist at the Vienna University. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth Kalendan, uh, who is a geographer at uh, Indiana University Bloomington. So uh, welcome to our speakers today. Uh, and uh, to uh, start our discussion, I will just start with the kind of the short intro that you already um, read on, on Facebook, uh, but just what we wanted to discuss uh, as the um, editorial board of uh, Spilne uh, Journal uh, together with you. So, of course, we wanted uh, to start uh, off uh, by the question of uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees who were displaced uh, by war, um, in particular after Russia's full-scale invasion uh, on the 24th of February uh, last year. Um, and uh, we know from discussions uh, on uh, with uh, activists and researchers who are looking at uh, the questions of uh, refugees and displaced people, uh, that uh, there seemed to be uh, a kind of non-symmetrical um, acceptance and welcome of Ukrainian refugees um, that who are welcomed often more enthusiastically uh, or seem to be welcomed more enthusiastically than people from other countries. And that became a ground for some conflicts. Some um, migrants from other countries in the European Union uh, were um, often voicing uh, these uh, voice of concern that uh, uh, there's this uh, preferential treatment sometimes of Ukrainian um, refugees. Um, and uh, that the asylum system in, in general in this way, despite being so um, welcoming to Ukrainian um, refugees, uh, showed uh, some inefficiency in addressing uh, the problem of, of refugees and displaced people uh, more generally more, and more globally. So um, to, now is the fifth panel of, of our conference and uh, it is this, uh, dedicated to the international uh, asylum system. Uh, and the questions that we want to focus on is how and why did Ukrainian refugees acceptance and accommodation differ from people from other countries? How much help to the refugees was provided by the state and what was left to the civil society and uh, in some cases to diaspora networks? Uh, this is actually a question not, that's relevant not only for the Ukrainian case, but uh, for uh, other cases as well, because we know that uh, quite a large share of help is being provided not by the state, but by uh, other agents. So who are these agents and uh, what share of, of help to the refugees are they um, taking on themselves? Uh, then uh, one of the key questions for today is how can we build solidarity between displaced people from different countries? Uh, and also how could, could the experiences of Ukrainians become the precedent for some change and perhaps even radical change of the international system of welcoming and accommodating uh, displaced people? So these are the questions that uh, we uh, threw in to the participants to think about ahead of time. They prepared some uh, answers, some short answers to these questions. Uh, and uh, we will start with uh, Ruslana and uh, with Aisha, uh, who will present their research uh, on, uh, on the welcome of Ukrainian uh, refugees in uh, Austria. Uh, and they, they will speak about it, but also maybe making some uh, links, more theoretical links and links to some of the questions um, for other contexts. So, um, Ruslana and Aisha, the floor is yours. Um, you you do have the option to share screen. Thank you so much for this opportunity to to contribute to to the conference. Um, I'm not sure how short we will be, like sh how short our answers will be, but we will try our we best. We do have we do have time, uh, in particular, because um, we have one fewer participants than uh, we we initially did. So don't worry about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so can you see the slides? Uh, yes. Okay, great. 
So um, in our contribution, we will try to address all the four questions um, prepared for this panel uh, by relying on the findings of our research arrival infrastructures, processes of emplacement of displaced people from Ukraine and Vienna. Um, this project was launched by the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, and we conducted fieldwork for it in Vienna between July 2022 and September 2023. Um, this uh, included interviews with uh, displaced people from Ukraine, interviews with representatives of different actors involved in the providing assistance, such as governmental and non-governmental organizations and grassroots initiatives. And we also looked into the data, apart from the interviews, we looked at, uh, we used participant observation, looked into relevant policy documents, statements and media materials. Um, you you can see this uh, the second slide right now right uh, is that correct yeah. Okay, good, thank you. So we want to start by saying that it has already become conventional to speak about the mass influx of the Ukrainian displaced fleeing the war as exceptional. First, due to the, its scale, the largest in European countries since World War II, and second, because of the first activation of the Temporary Protection Directive. And this air of exceptionality in many ways shaped the perception and analysis of the way the influx of people um, has been unfolding and managed by the governments and civil society. But it is exactly because of this aura of exceptionality and supposedly prefer preferential treatment that it, that it is important not to approach this case as exceptional, but instead look at it in relation to other instances um, of application of temporary protection in relation to the erosion of the system of international protection in general and explore the potential for developing um, solidarities. So in, in our presentation, we will first address the first second, and fourth question, and then we will discuss the to, to discuss the reception and treatment of the Ukrainian displaced, particularly using the example of Austria, the role of the state, the role of the civil society, and the implications all this has for the system of international protection. And after that, um, Aisha will return to the question of building solidarities. Um, so to start, um, <clears throat> so when it comes to the treatment and the temporary protection status of the U Ukrainian displaced, the first thing to note is that while the temporary protection directive was, in um, it was introduced in 2001 in the aftermath of the war in former Yugoslav countries, so while the directive does list basic guarantees and rights, it does not specify the level of provisioning um, of the or the mechanisms of implementation by the EU states. As a result, when it was first activated in early March 2022, European countries, including Austria, enjoyed a significant discretion in the implementation of temporary protection in their national legal context and in deciding how to provide access to the labor market, basic social services, accommodation, and other spheres. And in this situation, the existing schemes of asylum procedures and management of forced migration, as well as the historical legacies of governing the displaced, proved to be important in shaping the current practices. In particular, the path taken by Austria was primarily shaped by the country's general approach to migration, the specificity of its federal government system, and the constellation of political forces in the country um, in general. Um, the, the decisive factor for temporary protection in Austria was the decision to include displaced people from Ukraine in the system of basic care, or um, in German it's called, called Grundversorgung. Uh, basic care is a system that was introduced in early 2000s for basic provisioning to asylum seekers during the period of their asylum application. So when it comes to the assistance within the basic uh, care system, currently it entitles uh, one to cash allowance up to 260 euros per month for an adult and accommodation assistance up to 330 euros per family or a place in organized facilities. So in this latter case, when people live in organized facilities and when they're also fed, the cash payment is reduced to 40 euros per month. And this is what Ukrainians also get because they were put in the system. 
Um, our interlocutors from large NGOs in Austria suggested that the conditions within the base is within the system of basic care and such a low level of support were defined by the political intention to disincentivize potential asylum seekers from applying in the context of the from applying from for um refugee status in the context of the general anti-migration ban of the government. And uh, being an instrument in the asylum process, the basic care system has features that are in contradiction uh, with the status of temporary protection. First, uh, basic care system hinders access to the labor market by making even those modest or we can say low forms of assistance conditional on the absence of income above 110 euros per person per month. And secondly, the provisioning scheme within the system was designed for asylum seekers who are predominantly housed in organized facilities such as dormitories and are restricted in their mobilities by the existing relations of the asylum procedures. Um, meanwhile, from the first days, the absolute majority uh, of the Ukrainian displaced in Vienna and in Austria in general were high housed in private accommodation uh, for free or for payment at different rates. Um, um, a different arrival trajectory of displaced people from Ukraine also contributed to the specificity of the situation. In Austria, conventionally, and as was also the case in 2015, potential asylum seekers would be met at the state border by the, by the representatives of the federal state and later distrib distributed across different federal lands. In 2022, Ukrainian citizens, by the virtue of free movement facilitated by the visa-free regime, were arriving directly to Vienna by trains, buses, or private cars. And this put a disproportionate burden and responsibility on the city of Vienna, which was, however, shouldered by the outstanding involvement of civil society. Um, the essential role of civil society and remarkable solidarity became the dominant modus operandi, operandi um, of managing the influx of the Ukrainian displaced in Vienna, and in fact that was the case in other European localities too. Um, the uneven landscape of large NGOs, grassroots organizations, and individual volunteers was crucial in the immediate reception, provisioning of essential care, accommodation, and information. Such over-reliance on civil society is in general along the lines of the broader global tendencies in providing social services, such as NGOization and voluntarization, but this engagement of civil society also needs to be situated in relation to the pre-existing system in Austria. In particular, in Austrian um, asylum system, there is a long established practice of the federal state and the federal lands, some contracting the provision of care for asylum seekers to NGOs. Uh, moreover, our interlocutors from NGOs underlined the unpreparedness of the state for the influx and its reluctance to build uh, on the experiences of the previous waves of forced migration and establish long-term and durable solutions. In fact, some solutions that emerged in the wake of 2015 were dismantled or already over the next several years. And in this light, this unpreparedness of the state appears to be uh, strategic or at least chronic. And even after the shock of the initial period has passed, the overall alliance on civil society continued to make the situation unsustainable due to the dwindling amount of available resources, burnout, and the shrinking basis of the volunteering workforce. Similarly, as the offer of private accommodation declined over time, uh, no sustainable housing solution or supporting scheme for costs appeared in, in Austria. So as a result, the response to the influx of people relied on a patchwork of ad hoc tactics and schemes in order to address immediate problems, often with a relatively short horizon um, of planning. This ad hoc approach and treatment of mass influxes as something unprecedented and unexpected also resulted in a basic failure of the second light of reception, that is providing the necessary support in the medium and long, medium and long term. The short-term solutions were additionally justified by the rhetoric of a quote-unquote short, short war and the wishful thinking that the displaced would soon return to Ukraine. 
As a result, people housed in private accommodation were left to their own devices and had to rely on their own resources, personal networks and donations to get by with basic necessities since they would need to wait for many weeks uh, to get their first monthly allowance and then would receive their payments once every two, three months. Such an approach to managing displaced uh, people was not unique to the reception of Ukrainians. It's in general in lines with the historical pat pattern of Austria treating large numbers of incoming displaced people, including uh, the war, the Cold War period, and positioning itself as a rather transition hub than uh, a place for final destination. So this system it is. Um, Garrett to to be a place of transit and non-arrival rather rather than arrival. So uh, many people were pushed to take the decision. Uh, many people from Ukraine to take the decision uh, of leaving Austria for Ukraine or for other countries. Um, those who remained had to develop a patchwork of coping strategies strategies to sustain themselves in the long term. Um, due to the insufficient level of assistance, one has to secure additional sources of support. This includes seeking diverse forms of income in Austria or from elsewhere, remittances from relatives or friends, savings, accommodation provided for free or at a lower than the market price, various humanitarian aid and, and the like. Overall, even, the, uh, even though the reception of people from Ukraine was marked by unprecedented expression of solidarity, their situation in Vienna continues to be characterized by many struggles, shortages, and vulnerabilities. Moreover, the over-reliance on civil society results in a number of bottle bottlenecks, and in the long term, uh, term, it does not seem to be sustainable unless systematic sta state support is put in place. In this regard, the situation of people from Ukraine does not represent an exception. Instead, it exposes um, the already existing tensions and dynamics of the systems that govern the reception of the displaced people in Austria in general and made more visible its many lacks and shortages. So to move to the fourth question, we need to zoom out and consider the case of the Ukrainians, Ukrainian displaced and the European temporary protection in the context of the structural factors that facilitated the implementation of the temporary protection regime and in relation to other historical and geographical precedents of temporary protection regimes. Um, and also we need to consider what, what the proliferation uh, of these temporary protection regimes means in the context of the system of international protection. Um, so it is now common to refer to temporary protection as a sign of the preferential treatment of the Ukrainian displaced in contrast to the racialized discrimination um, other migrants are subject, subject to. In this regard, we find it important to stress the role of the structural factors that preceded and facilitated the decision to apply the temporary protection status in the first place. One such factor was the role of what um, Gameltov, Hansen and Hoffman call legal entanglements. That is, the pre-existing regimes of free or simplified border crossing between the countries in shaping the policy responses to mass influxes. Similar to the situation of the Syrians in Turkey and Venezuelans in Latin America, this was also true for the Ukrainian citizens who, since 2017, enjoyed a visa pre regime with the EU. In addition, in addition uh, temporary protection is often, also not always implemented um, in regions that already have relatively extensive labor migration and thus continued connections and networks, which was also the case with uh, displaced people from Ukraine. So to further unpack what is often presented as pre preferential treatment of the Ukrainian displaced by the EU countries, it is, it is important not to approach this case primarily as exceptional and instead situated in connection to other regimes of temporary protection that, that proliferated in response to mass uh, influxes. This is the case with the reception of Venezuelans in Latin America, as most countries of the region, region came up with temporary protection frameworks to regulate their stay. They opted for these schemes, even if the existing regional agreement and national legislations potentially allowed for the qualification of Venezuelans for more permanent forms of international protection. In another instance, Turkey introduced a temporary protection um, 
regime for Syrians who arrived in the country fleeing the war. The European Temporary Protection Directive itself draws on the precedent of temporary protection schemes introduced by individual European states during the wars in former Yugoslavia and represents an attempt to formalize and harmonize the, relation, uh, the regulations of temporary protection in the, at the EU level. Therefore, temporary protection frameworks rather than, than forms of international protection have become an increasingly widespread instrument for dealing with mass influxes also in the countries that ratified 1951 convention. The status, the status of temporary protection typically implies the right to legally reside in the country, immediate access to the labor market and some for, forms of social provisioning, including healthcare, it is granted on a group basis and for the limited time of the status validity. These distinctive features make such statuses substantially different from international protection. Uh, states introduce them as an, uh, as an alternative to international protection while keeping the scope of international protection relatively narrow and avoiding its expedient extension along with its associ associated rights and long-term guarantees to large incoming groups. Um, formally, temporary protection is not supposed to become a, uh, a substitute for international protection. However, in practice, it often functions as such. This is especially the case when there is no envisaged transition to a more permanent form of protection and legal resi residence. The, the implementation of temporary protection is often justified as a means to alleviate the pressure from the overburdened system of asylum applications, which is not suited for mass influxes. However, it can become the dominant solution with no clear path to a long-term stay, as it happened in the case of people from Ukraine in the EU. Also, considering the ambiguity that the very notion of quote-unquote mass influx carries, the situation becomes easily susceptible to be represented as a crisis, implying that it is an exceptional situation where the existing instruments fail to be useful. Such framing serves to justify the introduction and the establishment of temporary protection. It also disguises the, recurrent, the current character of mass displacements and downplays the need for more durable solutions. In contrast to international protection, the standards and guarantees temporary, of temporary protection are not fixed in, at the international level and are temporary by nature. This makes such solutions more attractive to national governments. Also, as I already mentioned earlier, the, formulation, um, the formulations of the EU directive remain relatively loose, ambiguous in general, and this in turn provides broader space for possible interpretations by national governments. And as a result, the actual re realization of temporary protection remains a political decision at the discretion of nation states and is practically susceptible, uh, susceptible to re many reinterpretations and rapid changes. And here I pass uh, the floor to Aisha. Okay, thank you very much. I think you could stop stop sharing the um, uh, slides. Yes, I think it is better. I'm old fashioned, I don't have the PowerPoints. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for allowing us to share our work and then have a discussion and uh, get feedback. And we're very happy to be part of this platform. Thank you very much. What I would do is that I would go to the kind of the uh, the kind of uh, some uh, important points that uh, from the what uh, Ruslana was presenting and then also uh it would the kind of the topic that the commons and in relation to the commons then try to make some points about the solidarity question which is I think very important. So what we um and um, what I would like to underline is that the common grounds, commoning and solidarity try to uh, walk you through uh, our work through those concepts. What we wanted to show is that rather than being an expression of an unprecedented benevolence towards Ukrainians and an instance of their racialized preferen uh, preferential treatment, the introduction of temporary protection has been in many ways shaped by the pre existing structural factors within the EU and the legacies of managing forced migration in Austria. 
The status of temporary protection is characterized by multiple vulnerabilities, as Ruslana underlined, especially due to having no viable transitioning to other forms of protection or permanent residence. This puts the, I mean, we're talking about on the basis of our research on uh, Austria, but there are certain things I think it goes beyond. This, this puts the Ukrainians, uh, this kind of not being able to change their status, puts the Ukrainians in a particularly vulnerable position, especially in the long run. And this is a vulnerability the displaced from Ukraine share with the others under temporary protection elsewhere. And I think this is very important to keep in mind. In general, moving to a temporary protection system becomes also part and parcel of the erosion of the international protection regimes in favor of short term and less standardized frameworks, this ambiguity and looseness at the discretion of the nation states. And we have seen that how that has been handled. And Austria is different than Germany, although it shares some, uh, uh, some grounds. Therefore, rather than capitalizing on racialized tropes that are pitting displaced people uh, coming from different regions against each other, it is essential, we think, to uncover the commonality of the precarities and insecurities displaced people face, look at the structural aspects that facilitate these processes and, and spell out the implications they have for the system of international protection in general. I don't think that we should be really all the time focusing on this kind of benevolent states or that kind of the racial preferential treatment. If we aspire alternative imaginaries of politics and society and solidarity, and I think in this group we share that kind of a desire and aspiration, we need to challenge the um, hegemonic, you could say, existing categories, orders, and subject positions inscribed to different groups of migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, as there were as they these work against different groups of the displaced solidarizing with each other. I think we have to be wary of those kind of categorizations, although these categorizations have consequences. Rather than inscribing them to different geographies of imaginaries with racial tropes and or assumptions about the nature of the states granting the displaced some rights, we might look at the common grounds of the differentially labeled displaced within the existing structures of inequalities. This requires, we think, moving beyond the narratives about the benevolence of European societies and states and its lack of in elsewhere and the concomitant racial tropes about the specific displaced groups. There is a need to concentrate on the commonalities of different groups of the displaced in terms of vulnerability and uncertainty. Um, why I'm saying that? Because it is this kind of the benevolence uh, trope, which we saw in relation to the Ukraine displaced from Ukraine in Europe, that we were seeing similar kind of stuff in relation to the Syrians in Turkey. But they were never talked about. When we were talking about the benevolence of European states in 2020, uh, 2022, then we were not talking about that this temporary protection state status granted to the Syrians, millions of Syrians in, in Turkey. So this is what I'm reading. And these racial tropes were there too. That's saying that, oh, they're small, similar. They have the similar kind of the religion. We are sisters, brothers. And we saw that actually things didn't work that way, but there was similar, very similar kind of uh, 
parallels. Focusing on common grounds, I think, is important not to reproduce the taken for granted divides of class, race, and ethnicity through which hegemony functions. If we want to go beyond the kind of the hegemonic imaginaries, I think it is important. This urges us to reject and move outside of the exceptionality and the crisis frame displacements. Crisis carries the danger of presentism and wails the spatial and temporal location of knowledge production. In this case, who identifies what is a crisis and as something exceptional is always from a location. It is perspectival, of course, and always enmeshed and meshed with the power relations of a particular time. For example, the large scale displacement, again, I would like to go back to the Syrians in Turkey, and the large scale displacement of people from Syria into Turkey was not identified as a crisis between 2012 and 2015, where the mass influx took place, millions came. These displacements, were designated as a crisis only in 2015 when they started moving to Europe, much less numbers than they were in Turkey. So, and interestingly, it became a refugee crisis, not only from the perspective of Europe, but today it acquired a place as such within the public debates and academia in Turkey too. So this is what I am referring to. This is the dangers of that kind of exceptionality and the crisis. Rejection the, rejecting the exceptionality narrative is important for any kind of solidarity of the displaced, which could become in this context, I think, we think, a kind of counterpolitics. So we would like to think about the question about solidarity as within the frame of what could be the counterpolitics to the existing politics. Here we would like to underline the importance and transformative nature of acting together in claiming rights and justice, what is referred often as the processes of commoning. By commoning, one refers to the kind of frictional heterogeneity of different groups coming together. It is not a kind of a, uh, easy task. It is frictional. It is conflictual. But different groups coming together with an active sense of producing a common project or uh, prospect while maintaining multiple separate alliances around specific goals and identities with respect to gender, class, ethnicity, legal status, you name it. Thus, commoning is not about the erosion of difference and the easing of disputes among the displaced, but it, is, it points out to the way different groups connect to each other in action. That I think we would, I would like to uh, underline in, um, our, uh, in my part of the our research. Drawing on Anna Arendt, who sees the political realm of the police as emerging directly from acting together, from common words and deeds, we could imagine a kind of quote unquote, insurgent solidarity, uh, not like kind of the insurgent citizenship, but insurgent solidarity in the construction of a realm within which people become political subjects. The commoning processes, and it is a disruptive uh, action, the commoning processes and the alliances they forge for claims and social justice become crucial we think, to a transversal, transversal politics that extends beyond historical divides, be categorized, called upon uh, of different groups that are categorized differently, called upon and studied in terms of those divisions. This, of course, urges us to think and act beyond also the migrant non-migrant native divide too. So it is this kind of the kind of a more frictious, inclusive solidarity 
uh, it should not be only as the newcomer's solidarity. The acting together of the displaced, their commoning could be seen as the basis for generating not only a transformative vision of society, but also of fellowship, companionship, in short, kind of a sociability among the differentially positioned displaced. Displacement is not in the monopoly of the refugees, migrants, and then the newcomers. They have different kinds of displacement. It is. It should be recognized. But there is there is a kind of a commonality. So a broader framework addressing the commonalities in terms of the vulnerability that mark the livelihood of the displaced, also those under temporary protection system in different geographies might be an important step so that thinking about the displaced from Ukraine together with the displaced in Turkey or in Venezuela or uh, maybe in US is an important step to question the disconnections achieved through the workings of hegemonic frameworks, frames, and politics. This is that is why I would like to think of that uh, talking about solidarity as counter politics. We all know that hegemonies work by making connections and disconnections, endless legal differentiations, refugees, asylum seekers, subsidiary protection, etc are also part of the politics of disconnections. We are not saying that the legal status do, are not important, but my, this kind of endless proliferation is a kind of a tool of those making politics of disconnections. This is one of the main reasons that we are using displaced people rather than any other notion, and not because we want to reiterate the displaced people category as a kind of a legal fiction applied to Ukrainians. We will conclude, I think, by underlining the fact that the designation of exceptionality to the massive influx of the displaced from Ukraine becomes the idiom through which the hegemony works. So this kind of the exceptional kind of and the benevolence and the racial tropes. This is how that the hegemony uh, works. Hegemonic frames conceal the relations and connectivity and connect. So domains that are in fact connected appear to be disconnected. So in that sense, thinking about solidarity of not the similar, but the different and conflictual, frictional, not conflictual, maybe, frictional solidarity, it might be an important starting point thinking about counter politics and envisioning a different society and politics for us on the basis of the what we were confronted with the several uh, streams of displacements. Thank you. I will stop here and uh, for our paper and we'll, Olga might be jumping into the questions, but we would leave Olga out with her COVID. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Ruslana and uh, Naisha, for this fascinating uh, presentation. And I'm glad I gave you more time uh, so that I could hear uh, all um, uh, all the richness, both kind of the empirical side and the, the, the theoretical um, underpinnings um, of, of your work. Uh, so I will now pass the uh, floor to Elizabeth Dunn. Um, and uh, I know Elizabeth. I I told you that we don't have to prepare formal presentations, so uh, it's it's okay. Rusl it was Ruslana's initiative to do a big PowerPoint, uh, so don't <laughs> worry. And I know Aisha <laughs> says uh, uh, I'm more conservative, so we are we are all a bit conservative here, and we that wasn't an, an expectation. <laughs> and I, we would I be have, really happy have... to hear your comments uh, on uh, yeah on uh, what was shared or your observations from your own field work. Uh, yeah, you were, yeah. Uh, so go I, ahead. I've never uh, heard anything come from Aisha that wasn't already exquisitely thought through. So I expected no less. Um, so I'll, I'll begin by talking a little bit about the field work I did with Ivona Kalashevska from the University of Warsaw 
and then talk a little bit about the ways I have been thinking about forced migrants comparatively. Um, when the war broke out, uh, the first thing I heard was that uh, ref Ukrainian refugees, and here I use the word very loosely, Ukrainian refugees were streaming into Rzeszów, Poland, the town where I had done field work 30 years before. So, of course, I immediately jumped on a plane and ran to the Polish-Ukrainian border. Uh, Ivana and I spent three weeks on the border near Rzeszów and Przemysz, and we started by working in a large transit center. It was um, a building which had been a former merchandise mart for trans-border traders and had been converted into sleeping quarters for 5,000 new people per night. Um, so here, the little town of Przemysz, which was 60,000 people, was being overwhelmed by more than 50,000 people uh, crossing per day and was having to find food, shelter, and accommodation for them. One of the things that we started looking at, of course, was this massive volunteer solidarity response. And Ivana and I became really interested in the ways it operated differently than the standard international humanitarian system response, which is usually carried out by a network of nation states intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations and international NGOs. Uh, as you mentioned, Anastasia, the, um, the, the international system of aid actually broke down during the Ukrainian crisis in very surprising ways. Um, what we were interested in is understanding how a system that had been built for a kind of Fordist logistics, that is the ability to move large quantities of standardized products um, to give out in highly standardized distribution packages had failed in the heartland of industrial capitalism. And so we began to look at the, the, the failures of this system as a failure of Fordist production and distribution. We also started looking at the ways that these new forms of, of solidarity networks were arising, particularly as they were mediated by um, internet sites like Facebook. And what was interesting for us is that they functioned very, very importantly as a kind of flexible accumulation system, or at least a flexible distribution system, so that networks of people were coming together on Facebook very quickly transiting goods through the network and then flying apart to form the next network in response to a need. And for us, the interesting thing, I mean, first of all, I have to say, I think these networks were extremely significant. Um, we watched in the first week of the war, uh, one network move $1.2 million of goods in under six days. It was truly amazing to watch the organization and the volume of stuff that was passing through these networks. And we think they indeed posed a significant challenge um, to the ability of nation states to um, respond in standardized ways to crisis. So we became really interested in why these networks operated so efficiently and under what conditions they operated. I mean, obviously, this is much easier to do in Poland than it would be to do in South Sudan, um, not only because of the avail widespread, ability, widespread availability of cell phones and internet, but also because of the widespread availability of industrially produced products that people could buy at retail and then move through these networks. So... Um, so that's kind of where we started and we put out a couple of papers about this. We also have been looking at what we call humanitarian smuggling, which is the movement of non-sanctioned goods across the border into Ukraine via volunteer networks. And, um, you know, these are things that I, those of you in, in Ukraine have seen a lot of um, things like uh, body armor, drones, uh, spare parts for AK-74s and so on um, that are kind of not, not military goods, but meant for use by the military, not weapons, but sort of the things around weaponry. 
Um, so I, we got very interested in those people and the ways that they began to pose a challenge to the state sovereignty of both Poland and Ukraine and of the European Union um, because of the high volume of their transit across the border. And these things are traveling in small little vans. The loads are very small, but the aggregate volume, at least in the first year of the war, was fairly high. And so we started to look at the ways that the movement of these goods highlighted both uh, the Ukrainians' inability to provide for their own military, and that is the failure of the Ukrainian state, but more importantly, the failure of the European Union to control transborder movement. And um, it's been interesting to see the ways in which um, the, the degree of scrutiny for these van loads of goods has increased dramatically in the second year of the war as the European Union tries to control the flow of these products uh, into the battle zone. I think for me, what, what both of these cases, the flow of refugees outward and the flow of humanitarian and paramilitary goods inwards um, point out is the ways that forced migration challenges state sovereignty. And so I've started to think a little bit about um, the ways that the international asylum system um, and the ways that international border control function as sorting devices or categorization devices. And um, I, I give you these ideas in a fairly form uh, because I'm just now starting to think about it. But I began by questioning um, the ways that the international asylum system starts by depending on an idea of the perfect victim. A perfect victim is blameless, both individually and collectively, is passive. That is, ideal refugees are the targets of bureaucratic action, but are not themselves participants in the conflict. And they're also highly standardized. That is the figure of the refugee that is elicited by the 1951 UN Convention on the Status of Refugees takes a highly standardized notion of what, what people do to become refugees or what is done to them to make them refugees. And it posits them also as standardized people with a highly standardized package of need. So you can see when you start to look at things like the World Food Program packages, which are delivered to displaced people, they posit things like an identical number of calories per person, no matter your age, gender, weight, it's 2,240 calories per person per day. Um, so what was the distinction for me in the Ukrainian crisis was that Ukrainians seemed on the surface at least to meet the definition of the perfect victim as it's embodied in the 1951 convention. The Russian invasion made Ukrainians collectively innocent. It made them uh, more or less passive. That is, they were forced into mobility, but they were not actively seeking to become mobile. And it assigned most of them a highly standardized story of what had happened to them and why they had been forced out. Um, I think that the contrast is really profound when we look at other kinds of forced migrants who might be considered as refugees, but are not. And so I looked at two comparative cases pretty strongly. First, I went out to the Polish-Belarusian border. And what was interesting there was that there were a hodgepodge of migrants from different countries of different ages, genders, and backgrounds who were trying to cross the border fence into the European Union illegally. Um, they share that kind of variability in status and story and origin with uh, people, for example, on the US-Mexico border who come from a wide variety of countries, a wide variety of political situations, and who can be, um, for example, the victims of state, state action, that is they're being terrorized by their own states, or they can be the victims of non-state actors like drug cartels, um, 
who are not accounted for in the 1951 convention. So what happens is, I think that the first difference is not a racial difference, but a difference in the ways that different these two different groups can be standardized to fit a narrative about victimhood that is embodied in the 1951 convention and carried into both EU law and American law. Um, the interesting thing for me um, is that the figure of the refugee then stands in contrast with both the active humanitarian, the, the person who is either part of civil society or part of an international agency, and whose job it is to deliver aid to the passive victims, and also to the active voice of the scholar whose job it is to denounce this system of inequality. That is, people who are good refugees as opposed to illegal migrants um, are people who are passive and because they are not potential combatants. That is, um, usually they're women and children and not men, for example. So they retain an aura of innocence and um, inactivity or passivity. They don't challenge state sovereignty because they are not actively seeking to avoid state control. And um, and they're also uh, uh, highly, then there's this difference in regular, how easily they can be regularized and standardized. Um, the Ukrainians, given that they were majority women and children had a very easily standardizable story where these two other groups did not. Um, I think I think that for me, this question of who challenges the state and who does not is essential to understanding why these different gr groups of refugees are taken up in such different ways. So the racial, the idea of a racial difference between Ukrainians and others, as we all know, is highly oversimplified. And it overlays European racial categories that don't necessarily apply um, and that obscure local racial categories. So certainly there are a wide um, array of narratives that separate, for example, Russians and Ukrainians racially rather than lumping them together as white. Um, likewise, there are huge ethnic, racial, social, linguistic uh, divisions among people coming from Afghanistan or from Syria that are completely obscured when we label them as global south or um, non-white others. So I don't think that that a simple definition of race and racism um, illuminates very much for us about how people experience these differences but or why these differences exist. What I think the dialogue about racism does is obscure the fundamental difference between the groups, which is whether they challenge state sovereignty. Um, when we, again, I'm turning back to the 1951 convention, but this was designed in its first instance for people who are predefined as innocent, right? They're people who can pass the credible fear hearing, which defines them as victims other kinds of forced migrants, those at the Polish border and at the uh, US border are not cast as those kinds of perfect victims, but instead as threats to the state. They are either coming because they are seen as actively, active combatants or actively seeking work. So they're economic migrants and not refugees. They are actively seeking to take advantage of aid systems. This is the narrative of the welfare cheat uh, in the United States. And so um, merely by existing at the border, they begin to challenge the state's ability to intercept, detain, evaluate, categorize, and bureaucrat bureaucratically process migrants. And that I think is the difference between them. Um, thus the difference between the groups is not racial, but is Actually, a relation, the difference is in a relationship between states and their own internal processes of defining, sorting, and processing human beings at the border. Um, 
Aisha mentioned Agamben, and I think that while this this discussion has been, uh, or you mentioned, sorry, exceptionality, um, and I think that while this discussion about Agamben has been done to death, right, I agree with you, it is really important to think about the ways that people who are seeking to cross illegally challenge the ability of the state to declare the exception. That is, these people who might otherwise meet the 1951 convention definition of refugees because they have been subject to violence are um, thrown out of the whole system which is used to determine refugeehood precisely because in attempting to cross illegally, they override the ability of the sovereign state to declare the exception. So um, I have been trying very hard to, um, I guess the, the point that I am trying to make is that when we think about only refugees and we don't contrast refugees to other forms of migrants, defined in lots of different ways. What we lose is the impact of the process of categorization in the first place, that it is the very labeling of some groups as refugees, deserving passive innocent victims, and other groups as other things, economic migrants, undocumented people, fence jumpers, um, illegal, uh, illegalized in various ways, um, it's that process of categorizing them, them that way that is the process that we have to study, not necessarily their treatment afterwards. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you once again to everyone for for your presentations. Uh, I would like to I would like to remind to those of you who are. Um, listening uh, as uh, uh, participants uh, today uh, that you can uh, write your questions in the chat window uh, and those of you who are watching on YouTube you can also write your questions down and uh, uh, the someone from our editorial board will pass them on here uh, into Zoom. Uh, so um, feel free to, to write your questions and I will start uh, now as, as a moderator uh, with, with a question from, from myself uh, that is uh, addressed to, um, to all of you. Uh, and uh, so one um, um, one thing I was thinking about when I was hearing all three presentations was about the response uh, uh, to displaced uh, people at different levels and how there is, of course, the level of the state, there's a level of uh, volunteers and uh, non-governmental organizations, the large NGOs, the small kind of smaller solidarity networks, uh, the uh, the the crisis of the big international level is something that hasn't been uh, discussed very much. People focus more on the kind of the na nation states, but not much on this uh, international system that was meant to be uh, uh, working <laughs> in cases uh, uh, like this. Uh, and uh, um, also some uh, aspects that were uh, not discussed, but that uh, were raised in in my research. I did research on um, refugees and Ukrainian refugees in France uh, was the role of uh, diaspora networks. Uh, and uh, that is also an often neglected part uh, where previous waves of uh, say labor migrants uh, from Ukraine or Ukrainians who came, uh, for example, were married to uh, Ukrainian women who are married to French men and uh, are now heads of the local Franco-Ukrainian associations uh, who all of a sudden have to become experts in humanitarian aid and uh, helping um, uh, displaced people, uh, something that they were not doing before, uh, and taking on a very large chunk of uh, responsibilities and roles um, uh, uh, that that the state uh, is also failing to, to deliver. Um, so that is another uh, very important agent uh, in uh, uh, helping uh, displaced people um, in the EU in particular. Uh, so, so with all these levels, uh, there doesn't seem to be like a coherent uh, system. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> like just, uh, chance that it might work out uh, if we're lucky or it will not work out. It might be working for a year or two and then we don't know what will happen next. Uh, so the question to you, how would you see uh, a system that is both like on the one hand more consistent and more coherent? So what, what should be these key agents that need to, you know, where this consistency and um, coherence and predictability needs to be kind of assured? 
uh, that uh, all the people, no matter where they come from, are aware and they will know that there is a certain system they can rely on. Uh, and at the same time, a system that is flexible enough to, to respond quickly, uh, to respond uh, efficiently, uh, as for example, Elizabeth uh, mentioned that these big NGOs turned out to be uh, completely inefficient in the first uh, uh, months of war. Uh, and we know that in Ukraine as well, uh, the local humanitarian aid that was collected was ma mainly collected by the small uh, volunteer networks and not by the uh, large uh, international humanitarian organizations. So there is this balance between um, flexibility and this kind of rapid response, responding uh, fast. Uh, uh, and also, but at the same time, uh, some consistency and uh, some bigger structures uh, that are more long lasting and more predictable. Uh, so um, if you could elaborate uh, on, on that question and also the relationship between all these different agents that, that are out there. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. I, and also, if you would like to respond to each other, that's also your opportunity to engage with dialogue with, with each other. So, um, yeah. Feel free, whoever wants to jump in first. I, I think what was interesting about the international aid response was, was precisely how slow these enormous um, aid agencies are to be able to turn to unexpected situations. This is in fact their job, right? They are supposed to be able to respond to emergencies, which are by definition not predictable. And yet, or, and then, Wait a minute, let me back up. So the, the emergency is supposedly not predictable. This emergency in Ukraine had was in eminently predictable, right? It had already been going on for seven years in some form, and yet the aid agencies could not get themselves into position to respond when the full-scale invasion happened. And I think from what we saw, they didn't actually manage to hit the ground and start providing aid for almost four months after the full-scale invasion. So for me, the interesting thing was the ways in which the bureaucratic system, which is meant to move aid, in fact, prevented the movement of aid and prevented these agencies from being able to do what they say by definition they do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, would anybody else like to uh, to comment? Um, uh, Olga, do you want to go or could should I or how how who Please would like? Please go ahead. I I will then add if I will have something to add. Okay. After you. Okay. Okay. Couple of things. First of all, I mean, I think this is this is very interesting, um, especially also what Elizabeth was saying. But uh, coming back to your question, the uh, to the levels of in terms of the civil society and then the NGOs, very different uh, levels. And I think here. It is, we are all the time looking at very different levels, but we are, I think it should be also important to look at them in time. So how they evolved, and then we can see the, some kinds of discontents of relying to all, I mean, they did a lot, but, uh, they should also um, um, work, at least me, that they worried me in the sense that the absence and the inability, what uh, Elizabeth was talking about, big kind of uh, care institutions, which should be prepared, and they were not doing it, and the states were not actually that so they were there were that kind of an inability i think these um yes they did move but i think in addition to the levels i would like to underline that it is important to look at it in time how things get disorganized what Oruslana was talking about burned out sustainability of the question and to go back to in terms of the question about the um, inability of those big 
care institutions not being able to. What I could tell for in relation to, for example, for Austria, that this emergency, this crisis helped that, I mean, they are there to be for all sorts of those kinds of unexpected situations. But what was done that the systems were dismantled? For example, after the 2015, where the many kind of um, uh, uh, infra quote unquote infrastructures were put into place, but they were dismantled. And we have to ask why they were dismantled and why that the state was not taking any responsibility. And the NGOs or those kind of the civil society, no matter how valuable it is, but then it uh, withdraws, there is this dark side of relying on civil society in the sense that there is no accountability and responsibility. And I think this is important to when we are saying that, yes, it was, it was very good. Let me give you another example from the earthquake in Turkey. That is the, um, uh, the earthquake that the state did and major care institutions were helpless and everything was organized. I mean, many things actually were organized through civil society. But then this actually, uh, um, yes, they, they provided some help, but sustainability and accountability of and then the, taking the the state got away with the responsibility and this big big care institutions also got away with the kind of the uh, responsibility and actually it came out that how they were very much entangled with the uh, capital so this is one response to your question in terms of le uh, levels and i think one should really look at this kind of the process and uh, if I, I mean, maybe if there are other questions we could go into, but then afterwards, if there would be some time, I would like to also ask a couple of questions to um, Elizabeth in terms of the uh, the sovereignty issue that the, I think this is the crux of it, that the, uh, we have to look at it, whether they challenge the sovereignty of the state or not. I, I just want to say in, in terms of this question of who was responsible that um, when I got to the Polish Ukrainian border, the so I was there on day nine days after the invasion and the International Organization for Migration, which is a UN agency, had set up tents at each of the border crossings and they were empty. And day after day, they were empty. So I started taking pictures of the empty tents every day and tweeting them at the IOM um, with funny, with kind of snappy captions, like um, having a wonderful time, wish you were here. Um, like you'd sign a postcard, you know? Um, and so every day I would tweet at them a, a picture of their empty tent and ask where they were and what they were doing. And um, after 11 days, they blocked me from all UN agency Twitter accounts. So um, I could no longer at them. Um, uh, and that was also true, by the way, of the Jewish aid agency, Hyas, which uh, was collecting money for the for war relief, but in fact had never shown up. So they also blocked me uh, until we were on a panel together and I asked in front of a large audience why I was blocked from commenting uh, on their non-appearance. So. I think that we're making a, an assumption though about, about a past and a current state that is a wrong assumption. It's the assumption that once upon a time, this network of states, intergovernmentals and NGOs functioned as a coherent entity. And I would argue that it, is, it has always been chaotic. So after the 2008 invasion in Georgia, I wrote a paper called The Chaos of Aid, um, where I was analyzing how inefficient the response there had been, which was 
you know, hundreds of times smaller. And what I found was that even though these agencies promised that they had bureaucratic mechanisms for coordination, things like the Organization for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs at the UN, or the cluster system, which was supposed to link NGOs to UN agencies. In fact, there were really powerful forces that, that made the response both highly chaotic and highly improvisational. So that most of the time, wherever they are, and throughout their formation since the late 1940s, early 1950s, these agencies have always acted chaotically and improvisationally. So what we're seeing is in fact more of the same, not something different. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we actually only have about 10 uh, minutes left. Uh, there are a few a few comments uh, already in, in the chat. Uh, there is another um, question that uh, I wanted to kind of, though we might not have time to discuss, uh, and that's related to uh, this criticism of the big uh, state structures and the uh, non-governmental organization that Elizabeth has just voiced uh, in Ukraine, uh, this criticism often uh, takes on a very neoliberal uh, tone of glorifying them, the civil society or Facebook groups or all these, you know, uh, informal networks as a kind of alternative. Well, look, so the state isn't working. Um, uh, the big NGOs are not working, but we together can, you know, make a difference. Uh, and it turns out that, of course, um, this cannot be a sustainable alternative for the long run. People do burn out. Uh, it does depend on the goodwill of, of these volunteers and of uh, these solidarity networks. So um, the question of, yeah, to what extent uh, this spontaneous uh, mobilization and enthusiasm and willingness to help uh, can can really be a, an alternative. And yeah, and, uh, and also that was raised, but picked up by Ruslan in the very first presentation that the, the Austrian state, it turns out that all, all these temporary protection schemes and the stock of benevolence actually exposes the inability um, of, uh, of the state to provide something more, more tangible and uh, more predictable. Yeah, so just dropping in that comment about that uh, kind of neoliberal uh, logic that is, that is often um, in there. And uh, uh, yeah, if we have time to talk about this, maybe not. But uh, uh, there, there are some comments that I will just read out. Uh, so there is one. Um, whether we can look at the state's responses both to Ukrainian refugees and the refugees on the Belarusian Polish border as types of state of exception, with the exceptionality of introducing temporary protection status for Ukrainian BS Polish EU exception in Podlasia region at the Polish border in 2021. Uh, so like the, the links between the two cases um, yeah, and how different they uh, they are. And another question that we have in, uh, in the chat is, did you experience cases of solidarity between different groups of displaced people? And uh, if you did, how, how did this become possible? And if so, if any of you have any empirical example of uh, this, solidarity between different groups of displaced people uh, and can um, share. And now there is another comment. Uh, wow, that's a big one. Let's see if I can read it out. Um, maybe not a question, but some comments. Uh, it won't be anything original as thousands. Oh my goodness, it's so difficult to read. Let's see. Oh, OK. Uh, it won't be anything original as thousands of people in Poland have experience of helping refugees from Ukraine, but maybe they will be useful in the discussion. I come from the Lublin region, one of the two regions that border Ukraine, and which I have the impression disappears somewhere when recalling the first month of war. A lot is said in the foreign media about Podkarpacie, Przemysl, and Rzeszów, and my region, a Helm or Lublin, much less. Both large NGOs and the Polish government would not have been able to cope with the situation if it had not been for a widespread mass movement. In my area, the region is large, and I live in its western part, i.e. more than two hours by car. Ties from before the war related to the work of Ukrainians in orchards, raspberry harvest, etc., played a big role. Uh, the problem of racism arose immediately. It affected Ukrainian Roma, uh, Roma refugees now about 60,000, which is much more than the traditional Ro Polish Roma community, about 10,000. And students from Asian and African countries, etc. And an anti-Ukrainian sentiment is now emerging with renewed force 
unfortunately. It is not only about the last election campaign, but also about the fact that the fear of refugees from Ukraine, mainly women, is strong uh, in one demographic group among young women from small towns. This is interesting because often this group is one, the more progressive is accounted for the strength of the protest against the restriction on the right to abortion in 2020. Some say it comes from competition on the matrimonial market, but this is a rather sexist idea. I'm not a sociologist, but I guess that the struggle in the service market, mainly beauty, and among the caring professions plays a role. So, okay, so these are the comments that we have. Uh, let's see, we have about uh, six, seven minutes, uh, and uh, this wouldn't, of course, uh, respond to all, all the questions that were raised, but uh, maybe each one of you would like to make uh, one final comment. Uh, I don't know if, Olha, you would like to um, make a, a comment as well after having listened to the presentations and uh, the comments. So let's say one uh, minute each uh, for some uh, uh, final comments. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, we will have to close. Um, yeah, in, in seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. Who would like to to go um, first? Uh, or shall we go in the order in which we were presenting? Let's go in the order in which we're presenting. Ruslana, would you like to, to say something? Yes, it's too many questions. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, questions, and then in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I don't think I would be able to fully and comprehensively respond to the question about the except states of exceptionality, but I just want to, again, kind of highlight the, the intention behind our presentation is that it's important to look at the constructivist side of this whole situation, how, how the crisis is constructed every time and how what it what it means and what it does in the political realm, including the political realm. Um, so just a quick note, um, the, the Wikipedia page on Ukrainian refugee crisis appeared on March 1, 2022. At that time, the number of people would not, was not that high and the state have not able been able to respond yet. So this, I mean, this shows in a way how quickly a crisis gets constructed out of nowhere. Um, so yeah, again, I, I wouldn't, I won't be able to respond to this comprehensively, unfortunately. About the question of examples of solidarity, I mean, both in our work, but also in my own experience, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm also with a displaced person ID in Austria, and I'm here with my mother. I can say that. Despite having my university here, I wouldn't be able to survive without having friends from Ukraine in Austria and having these connections, which are also expressions of solidarity on this more mundane basis. The question whether this spills out in a political sphere is very important. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, the recent, like, for example, um, the involvement of Ukrainians at Central European University and the recent um demonstration in support of people in Palestine may might be seen as one of the examples of such solidarity I think but again I don't have time to elaborate so thank you so much thank you Roslana uh well how would you like to uh, make a comment uh, on on any of the questions that were raised today yeah. Since you yes, thank you. I, thank you for providing uh, some space for me. Um, uh, reacting to the question of uh, like solidarity, we also have like fieldwork materials. For instance, many uh, many NGOs, like especially grassroots organizations, that emerged from two thousand fifteen, and that actually like were helping uh, people who fled from Syria first of all, but from wider region. Then, then the people whom they assisted, then these people returned actually as now providing help also to Ukrainian, uh, to the Ukrainian displaced. And they actually were one of the major volunteering force, for instance, for the major arrival center in Vienna. And they were explicitly saying that we remember how this type of help uh, was essential for us and how we now can uh, bring back but i think that there is also another angle of being uh victims of being displaced from uh, uh, uh by imperial aggression because for instance in syrian case there was also a very explicit sentiment against 
actions of uh, also Russian army. And it was also visible during the demonstrations um, uh, and it was expressed. So there are multiple angles of uh, building solidarity. And also, if I may, I want to shortly return to the previous question because it seemed to me uh, when you were saying about organization, you implied also how it should work, like how the system should work. And I think that one of the cruxes of our presentation was to show that it was not only a kind of organizational dysfunction, but how this functioning of the system is inbuilt in actually existing legislation so that it's not something that can be amended uh, by just optimizing organization, but how it very much uh, reflects and actually successfully um, successfully uh, realizes the intention or like the intention to limit migration, which is like guiding a lot of policies currently, uh, currently in migration. And I think also to underline that uh, in, uh, in our experience, also talking to different types of NGOs, they, uh, that this is that they, they also stress this idea that it's not about either or that the state is good or that the NGOs is good, but that it's important to have this landscape, to have this ecosystem of different organizations that uh, that can precisely have different flexibility of grassroots, more flexible at the initial stage, and then actually the state-related or big NGOs as able to accumulate these much more significant resources and on a systematic basis. But again, the, the question is how system is geared and whether it actually seeks to provide this synergetic effect to provide a better assistance or how actually other ration, uh, rationales are behind the functioning of the system. If uh, I do not know if my other colleagues want to agree or disagree with this point. But thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valha. And uh, Aisha? Uh, I think like even the time the that comments? we are for one paper, then we are three, then we should not <laughs> take that. The, I mean, uh, I think the, both Ruslana and Olga brought the kind of the solidarity issue very, uh, very vividly, very clearly in terms of with the examples. So maybe uh, I will pass the word to Lisbeth and if there would be any time, because I think we are when one paper, three voices, that it would not be fair. Okay, <laughs> go, go ahead, Elizabeth. yes. Thank you, that was very gracious. Um, I just would add one other thing that we haven't talked about, you know, we we often think of geopolitics as somehow being separated from economics, but of course it never is. And these wars are happening in the context of a global capitalist economy. And one of the big differences between the treatments of, of say, African migrants and Ukrainian migrants is their role in the receiving country's labor market. So Poland was delighted to have Ukrainians come um, there were already something like, I don't know, 3 billion, 4 million Ukrainians in Poland working before the war. Um, so taking 5 million more was, was a lot, but they were welcomed because they're highly skilled, they're well-educated, and there was a, a, an immediate place for them in an in, inserted into the labor market. And um, one of the commentators mentions, for example, the beauty industry or home health care. These were places in Poland where there was a lot of demand, um, not enough labor. And so this was the answer to a prayer, actually, economically. African migrants who are lower skilled and have fewer language skills and um, generally don't have computer skills and can't operate as graphic designers or uh, medical aides um, are so much less desirable on European labor markets that their entrance is seen as much more problematic. And I think you can never separate the reception of refugees from their place in, in the larger economy. Um, that's true in the United States where, <laughs> frankly, if we didn't have undocumented people, we would have no functioning food system. Um, I always tell people, if you like avocados, you should like undocumented Mexicans because they're picking your avocados. Um, we can never think of these people as separate from the market in which they exist, and that conditions their reception. 
Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for bringing that um, important consideration to, to our debate. There are many questions, of course, that remain unanswered, many uh, thoughts that were brought in uh, and that require further um, reflection. And uh, it's good that in a way that we're ending with, with all these questions, with all these uh, uh, points that you brought uh, to the debate, that uh, we can continue uh, reflecting on, um, about them on, on the pages of our journal in particular. Uh, and uh, we ran uh, over our time a little bit, so we have to end now. Uh, just before we end, uh, I would like to make an announcement about the last panel of our conference. As you know, it's been going on for uh, two days, yesterday and today. And uh, the last panel uh, would be it would be at 6 p.m. Uh, Ukrainian Kiev time, uh, which is in one and a half uh, hours. Uh, and it will be dedicated to the question of authoritarian regimes and imperialist um, aggression. So those of you who, who are interested, you're welcome to reconnect uh, in one and a half hours for our final uh, panel. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank um, all of you uh, for uh, making it today. Uh, the, a big thank you to uh, Ruslana, Volha, Aisha, and Elizabeth uh, for your input uh, and uh, to um, all who listen to the presentations who ask questions. Uh, so um, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope that our conversation will continue in uh, other forms um, in the future as well. So thank, thank you. you.